today's talk, there are five topics that we want to cover. Um, first of all, looking at the case management of remote hearings. Uh, secondly, looking at the tools that you will require to get remote hearings off the ground. Uh, thirdly, looking at the process and the contents of compiling electronic bundles. Um, fourthly, having a look at how remote hearings work in practice. And fifth, looking at the practical realities. Um, what is our experience of how these things have been working so far? Before I go on to those items, though, I, I just want to say a few words about the judicial approach to um, remote hearings and what seems to be a great deal of initial enthusiasm appearing at a number of different levels. A lot of you have probably seen um, talk about what's happening in the course of protection, where they've already had a three day, 11 witness contested hearing successfully conducted via Skype for Business. I understand that they are hearing or have recently finished hearing a nine day contested hearing. Both the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court um, have also heard contested hearings uh, via Skype for Business. And on the High Court bench, there appears to be real enthusiasm to make this work uh, as a means of keeping the wheels of justice turning. I I'll lead you to read the words of Mr Justice Tier um, in your own time uh, and focus instead on the more recent decision in the one Blackfriars Limited case uh, of Mr John Kimball QC. Um, one Blackfriars Limited uh, was a claim brought against the former administrators of a company in liquidation. It's a £250 million misfeasance claim. There is a five week trial listed for the beginning of June. Uh, at the PTR a few weeks ago, uh, the claimants, the current liquidators, applied to adjourn the trial on the basis that the current situation made it impossible. Uh, they said, first of all, that proceeding with the trial was inconsistent with the government's guidance. Secondly, that there was too great a health risk. Thirdly, that conducting a remote hearing was too great a technological challenge. And fourthly, that there was a risk of unfairness to them if the trial proceeded otherwise than with everyone attending in person. In a very carefully considered judgment, um, John Kimball rejected all of those submissions and said that in his view, the thrust of the guidance given by, for example, the Chancellor, uh, as well as the legislative changes brought about by the government, are, are actually in favour of keeping the court system moving. And that instead of trials being inconsistent with what the government is seeking to achieve at the moment, actually carrying on and looking things doing looking at doing things remotely is the government's intention. He said that with proper use of technology, any health risk could be overcome. And he was unconvinced that the technological challenges were too great for a five week trial with live witness evidence um, to be a problem. Interestingly, he was quite critical of the lack of evidence of technological challenge and therefore sent the parties away to work together to try and identify a way in which that trial could take place. And it seems to me that that is a lesson to all of us that it is probably very easy, particularly if you've got a reluctant client to say, well, the difficulties at the moment mean that the court are likely to adjourn us off if we ask for it. Actually, no. Um, there seems to be judicial acceptance or a certain judicial view that we need to crack on with things. It may be difficult, we may have to do things differently, but that should not prevent the court from hearing cases that have been listed and, and have been fixtures for a long period of time. Uh, that then brings me to the question of case management. Now, although there have been various legislative changes around, for example, the Coronavirus Act, it's important to note that actually the CPR is relatively unchanged and unchanged for the simple fact that it doesn't need to be changed in order to make remote hearings a possibility. Um, CPR 3.1 has always given the power to hold hearings by a remote means and the practice direction at uh, part 32 has guidance for conducting hearings by way of video conference. Although that guidance was conceived against the backdrop of one or maybe two witnesses uh, attending remotely in cases of illness, a party being overseas, etc. The, the guidance is actually far broader than people might appreciate, 
and also covers, for example, interim hearings, the inability of advocates to be present, uh, circumstances in which, for example, the judge might not be sitting in a courtroom, but at a different remote site. So uh, actually all of the tools are there and we do already have a touchstone to look at when we're considering what sort of directions should be granted. I indeed, what's quite helpful about the guidance is it sets down a test for when um, hearings by video conference will be appropriate. It says they'll be appropriate where they'll lead to the, quote, efficient, fair and economic disposal of the litigation. Now, the times might be remarkable, but I can't see that basic test changing. I suppose the only thing that is maybe any different is it's going to be far easier to persuade people that it is going to be efficient, fair and economic to have a remote hearing in circumstances where hearings might otherwise be effective, uh, might otherwise be ineffective rather, and where the parties might be waiting months to come back round. Now, the one area where there has been significant change is in relation to the principle of open justice. And this is what section 55 of the Coronavirus Act and most of the changes to the CPR, the practice directions to part 51 are directed at. The basic principle of open justice remains the same as it always has been, that the court's business should be done in public. And there is a presumption or a hope that even where there are remote hearings, those hearings can still be public hearings in inverted commas by the remote hearing being streamed in a courtroom. Just posing there or pausing there rather, I'd query whether or not it's actually legal at the moment to leave your house for the purpose of um, observing a court hearing in a courtroom, but nonetheless, um, that is the intention. But importantly, it is now much easier to have a hearing in private where that is what the interests of the administration of justice require. And in simple terms, if the parties in the court are agreed that a hearing is only going to be possible if it can take place in private, if it can take place remotely, then that is what the court is going to order. Now, the reason I raise the open justice question at the outset is because it seems to me that it's an important issue that the parties need to grapple with. It's very easy to say, well, whether a hearing's an open court or not is just a matter for the judge. But the truth is, judges have got a lot on their plates at the moment. The directions that they are having to give, uh, directions they're not used to giving, everything that we can do to make their lives easier is going to help. So it, it seems to me that where parties are requesting or liaising over a remote hearing, it makes sense for the parties to be engaging proactively on this open justice question. Do they think that this is a hearing that should be capable of being um, streamed in court? Or is that going to present a problem? And if so, can they provide a sensible rationale to the judge as to why a hearing in private is going to be more appropriate? The next stage when considering case management then is to look at the protocols that are being issued by the courts and the starting point for those of you doing business and property courts work is the business and property courts protocol that's being issued by the master of the roles uh, along with the president of the QBD, the chancellor of the high court, the senior presiding judge and the deputy head of civil justice. We're on I think the second version of the protocol dated the 26th of March but like any protocol or guidance that we might refer to during the course of the talk, um, do please check every time you go back to it that you are looking at the most up to date version. Um, on Monday uh, this week, I was receiving articles in my inbox talking about the uh, 20th of March protocol, which by the time the articles were circulated ho had already gone out of date. What has been the same though throughout the different iterations of the protocol is this big focus on the necessity to get behind remote hearings and to make them work in all cases, even those where there are litigants in person. And as set out on the slide, the protocol says it should normally be possible for all short interlocutory hearings to be heard remotely and also some witness cases, by which I infer it means shorter trials, applications with contested witness evidence, etc. So it's not just that individual judges are behind making remote hearings work, that is the clear policy of the court service as well. 
what I think is also particularly interesting about the protocol is that as well as setting out the different platforms via which the court is willing to conduct hearings, um, the court is also willing to consider any solution that the parties uh, might propose. So if you have a software package you think does a better job than, for example, Skype for Business, um, do feel free to suggest that to the court and the court should, under the protocol, consider that on its own merits. Uh, before I go any further, I've just noticed that there was a message I should have given to all of you at the outset. And that is to say, if you have any questions during any point of the talk, um, please feel free to raise them in the meeting chat. Um, you can get to the chat by moving your mouse where a little menu icon should appear in the bottom of your screen. And then if you click the speech bubble, the chat bar will open up on the right hand side. The idea is that we'll deal with as many questions as we can while we go through the talk and then circle back to pick anything else up at the end. Um, going back to the business and property court protocol, then the process is, it envisages is a fairly straightforward one. The onus is on the court, first of all, to suggest the solution that it proposes. So the court will say to the parties proactively, Either it thinks the hearing should go ahead or should be adjourned. And if the hearing is going ahead, whether that will be in person or remotely and where the hearing is taking place remotely. And the default has to be that the hearing will take place remotely. The court will explain what technological solution it proposes to use. The parties then have an opportunity to see e-file submissions in response effectively submissions either disagreeing with the hearing taking place remotely or seeking to suggest a different type of technological solution. After that, the court will make a determination normally on the papers as to how the hearings to take place. The protocol does envisage, though, the possibility of uh, further directions hearings, uh, effectively very short CMCs to deal with this question of uh, forum and technology. The big change in the process, uh, probably so far as most practitioners are concerned, is going to be the new focus on electronic bundles. And this is, of course, partially important because a number of judges will be working remotely themselves and so won't be able to access hard copy papers. The protocol envisages that bundles are now going to be prepared in electronic form. Uh, they will be single paginated bundles that will be CE filed. Uh, and just pausing there, it, it's important to remember that there is a limit on the size of CE file documents. I, I think that limit is 50 megabytes. So if, if you are preparing documents that are too large, then you're not going to be able to file them uh, and hearings requiring those documents are not going to be effective. No doubt because of that, the protocol makes clear that where you have an electronic bundle, the electronic bundle should only contain the essential matters um, to the hearing in question. So to a certain extent, it requires us to take a different approach to preparation. We're no longer considering whether it's reasonable to put something in. It's whether it's necessary to put something in. Where, for example, we've got particulars of claim with lengthy annexes. Ask yourself the question, do we need the annexes? Where there's a long contract, do we need any more than a couple of pages? Ditto when it comes to skeleton arguments and authorities lodged in support of them. Um, less is definitely more and less is more because more may mean that electronic bundles are simply too large to be transmitted to the judge in question. Stepping down from the protocol issued by the Business and Property Court, um, individual court centres are beginning to circulate their own standard form of directions. And in this respect, I think Birmingham was probably one of the first regional centres um, to get off the ground. Now, Birmingham's standard directions are fairly formulaic in terms of dealing with things like the platform for the hearing, the advanced provision of attendance forms, etc. But they're also interesting because there's a divergence of approach between the Birmingham standard directions order and the protocol when it comes to the form and content 
of e-bundles. I think I've already said that e-bundles under the business and property court protocol, it's a single continuous page number document to be CE filed. What Birmingham want, certainly on the current version of the directions, is individual PDFs lodged separately, each PDF with its own internal page numbering, and these PDFs to be emailed in rather than CE filed. I, I don't pass comment on whether Birmingham have got the right approach or, or whether the protocol's got the right approach. I, I simply highlight that you need to be particularly careful to focus on the directions that are given by the individual court centre. And we will try and get a copy of the Birmingham Business and Property Court Standard Directions up on the Chamber's website. Uh, one final point, though, before I move on um, on directions is simply to say that we actually think, uh, and this is a topic that Alan will pick up upon, that the standard directions issued by the court are not yet detailed enough. There's a number of matters they don't consider that parties will want to think about. Dress code, administration of oaths, connecting witnesses, etc. Um, a, a lot more of the I suppose the meat and drink of a hearing that might not automatically spring to mind, but you're going to need to make decisions about anyway. In addition, there's always the matter of without prejudice correspondence. How are you going to get that before the court? Um, is that something that a direction needs to be given in respect of, given that the option of passing up letters or part 36 offers to the judge is no longer going to be a, a possibility? It seems to us there that the obvious solution is probably um, filing a separate bundle of the without prejudice correspondence, but having that password protected so that the judge can be provided with the password by the advocates at the end of the hearing. Um, further directions here, in this case, these are the standard directions that are likely to come out from the Bristol Civil Justice Centre. Um, these are the directions for the county court, though, rather than the business and property courts. Uh, and if I flag the difference between um, the business and property courts and the county court, whereas the business and property courts are pretty much up and running with virtual hearings, the county courts are taking some time to catch up. It's not necessarily that there is any less judicial desire to, to get remote hearings working. Rather, the issue is one of resourcing. The county court at the moment is suffering from not simply a lack of staff because people are off sick or self-isolating, but the county court's going through a, a process of consolidation with business moved to fewer central court centres. Because of that, there is a need to focus on more urgent business. So before you're likely to get a remote hearing, you're going to have to persuade the court that your case falls in the urgent category. And only if the court's got some spare capacity is the court going to hear matters that aren't strictly classed as urgent. Uh, just by way of passing, I'll highlight another couple of sources of guidance for people. Uh, the HMCTS website has uh, numerous different codes, general hearing um, guidance and also guidance on joining remote hearings themselves. There's also quite a helpful live status update, which lets you know which court centres are open, which are shut, um, and even includes details of things like when certain courts are and aren't answering the phone at the moment. So if you need to get through to someone at a county court, the most sensible thing to do is to go on the court service website first uh, and check that the court you're trying to contact isn't one that's been shut or, or one that's not answering phone calls for a certain period. Uh, that brings me finally then to the priority business um, list issued by the county court. Uh, again, this is available on the courts and tribunals service website uh, and it is very much a moving feast. I, I just highlight for our purposes that there is a focus on things like freezing orders, injunctions, uh, and of course that's going to include not simply um, employment injunctions, but one imagines an increasing amount of work to do with, for example, um, retention of title clauses, access to goods, return of goods, access to property. If there is a real time element to the case, then the court is going to accept that that is urgent work, and it is likely that you will get a remote hearing listed fairly quickly. Um, if it's not urgent work, and bearing in mind in terms of things that aren't urgent, there is a real focus on keeping people and keeping businesses solvent and trading at the moment, 
then it may be that even if theoretically your hearing could take place remotely, um, you're not going to be listed for a considerable period of time. And with that, I'll pass over to Alan to talk about the tools that you're going to need um, to make all of this work in practice. Uh, thank you very much, James. Uh, and indeed, thank you to everyone for taking part. We've been overwhelmed by the level of participation uh, in this seminar. Downside is uh, this is, I think, my ninth run through and my voice is beginning to wane. So I'll try and hold out, but uh, forgive me uh, if I start to lose my voice a little bit. Um, we'd also like to thank the judiciary who've been very helpful, not only in opening themselves up to the prospect of conducting more hearings remotely, but also in terms of giving us their insight on how it might be achieved, which we've obviously then uh, been able to share uh, with you guys. Um, in terms of this segment, the next three parts that I'm going to deal with, we're looking at the logistical application of some of the principles uh, that James has set out in his first talk. Uh, and ultimately what it's about is achieving as best as possible a smooth and effective hearing. The start of that, of course, is to identify what tools we're going to need in our toolbox in order to be able to accomplish all of the stages that's going to fall upon our shoulders. Now, the first and obvious starting point is to consider what tools you already have in your arsenal. Many firms have very sophisticated case management software, uh, whether it's third party or bespoke, that will either do everything you need it to do already, or at least do a lot of the heavy lifting. And so by considering what you already have in your arsenal, you can identify where you have any gaps and you can look to fill those gaps. But what I'm going to do is set out what I think are the four key components and then some of the features that those components need to have. Uh, so we really need uh, PDF editing, large file sharing software, uh, video conferencing software uh, and internet stability. Now, they may seem obvious, but the one thing that perhaps isn't necessarily obvious is that when we're going to be taking part in remote hearings, we're going to be drawing in a lot of people that otherwise would not be involved in setting up and arranging the hearing, for example, witnesses. And particularly in respect of those last three, the large file sharing, video conferencing and internet stability, we need to ensure that those participants also have access uh, to the relevant software or platforms and that it's user friendly. Now, it's not for us to identify which software any, any one party should use. I'm just going to flag up some of the key providers uh, and say a little bit about them, partly to identify uh, what's out there, but also so that you can understand uh, what you need to have in your kit. When it comes to PDF editing, Adobe Acrobat Pro is really the Rolls Royce product. It does everything you're going to need it to do. And in fact, a little bit later on, uh, I'm going to demonstrate uh, making an e-bundle uh, using Adobe. There are, of course, other providers, PDF Expert being one of the uh, top of the list uh, options. In terms of large file sharing software, Guildhall Chambers, as I know a number of you do, use Mimecast. There are plenty of other platforms, but there are a great difference in terms of the way that those platforms operate. Uh, and indeed, when we're communicating law firm to law firm, those variances don't tend to matter so much. But we need to bring in to the equation that potentially uh, unsophisticated witness that doesn't have much by way of IT skills that you're going to need to potentially send documents to. One of the advantages of Mimecast is it does not require the end user, the person receiving the files, to either download software or to create a username and password. You can see how that might be a difficulty if you're sending documents to judges. They are not likely to be enamored by having to download multiple platforms or create multiple accounts. But that aside, the real issue is those witnesses because you need to make it as simple as possible. The advantage of software like Mimecast is that all you simply do is send out the files through the Mimecast platform and they receive it to their, um, their email box, whatever platform they use, and it provides a link and an access code and they can simply download it from within their browser. No need to create a username or password, no need to download bespoke software. Ultimately, it's about making it as user friendly and easy for all of the recipients to receive the necessary documentation. Uh, in terms of video conferencing software, the list would be endless. The three key providers that most of you, I'm sure, have heard of, Skype for Business, Microsoft Teams, which is the platform we're using, uh, and Zoom are the sort of market leaders. You may well have seen some of the news articles about Zoom. Indeed, Google yesterday announcing that it was banning uh, all of its employees from downloading Zoom onto a work computer. 
partly because of concerns over Zoom security. Uh, it's not for us to comment on the truth or accuracy of those concerns, save to highlight that it does underscore the importance when selecting whatever provider you wish to pursue, that you are satisfied that the software is secure and complies with your GDPR obligations. In terms of Skype for Business and Microsoft Teams, two points worth briefly mentioning. Um, Microsoft Teams is actually the evolution of Skype for Business and has been rebranded. Chief uh, difference is that it integrates better with Office 365, allows, for example, file sharing, such as we're doing now with our PowerPoint presentation, and indeed screen sharing, which allows you to uh, show not only documents, uh, but also uh, move your mouse to the relevant parts. And I'll demonstrate that in practice in just a second. The courts and tribunal service have suggested that, at least in the short term, they're sticking with Skype for business. And on that point, it's worth understanding if your firm has already migrated over uh, to Microsoft Teams, it's not retrograde. You can't now go back and log into Skype for Business or host anything through Skype for Business. Uh, you can download Skype for Business uh, from Microsoft's website. And if somebody else hosts a meeting, you can access it, uh, albeit as a guest. I'm now going to move on and look at electronic bundles and indeed many of us will be familiar with a form of electronic bundling. Uh, but what I'm going to look at is some of the more detailed requirements of those bundles for the purposes of an electronic hearing. And I've set out here, which should hopefully now be on your screens, a sort of flow diagram uh, with the key stages and some of the requirements of each of those steps. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's likely that you will have uh, case management software that will do a considerable amount of this, or, or indeed you may well have sophisticated IT departments or uh, other people within your business that can actually put this together. Uh, I still think it's worth understanding that process, uh, not least of which because if you're asking someone to put a bundle together, you need to understand exactly what it is you're after to make it a fully electronic bundle so you can communicate that to whoever performs the task. And I'm also going to take you through that stage from scratch as if you were using something like uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro in case you're uh, put in the position of having to do so. So the first step is compiling the documents that you're going to need. And for that, you'll need a single source repository. Your case management software may well provide that for you. It may simply be a case of creating a file uh, either on your server or on your desktop. Uh, and once you've gathered all of those files together, that's the point at which I recommend you then sort those documents into the order that you wish them to appear in the bundle. I do that simply by numbering the files um, with the following uh, uh, title. That enables you to not only sort the documents, but also assists with the process a little bit further down the line, as I'll demonstrate. Now, of course, those files may come in various different formats. They may be PDF already. They may be Word documents, Excel documents. Um, they may well be email files, EML attachments. And the next step is to convert each of those uh, into a PDF. Now, there are broadly three ways of doing that. The most common appears to be to print them off uh, and then have them scanned back in. Uh, potentially, if you've got a large Reaper graphics department, they can do that for you. Uh, and what you'll get out at the end uh, is a PDF file. Although there's some efficiency in doing it that way, it's not the way that I recommend. And, and there are broadly two reasons. Um, one, although there is some efficiency at the outset, it actually creates greater work for you at the back end. Uh, and that's an efficiency that I don't think is worth it. Uh, more importantly, um, the integrity of the document begins to break down the more often they are printed and re-scanned. Now, it may well be the integrity of the document is sufficient for, for the observer to read with their own eye, but that doesn't necessarily help in terms of the full electronic processing and formatting of the bundle, and sometimes there can be some difficulties there. What I suggest is actually either individually converting the files that you've gathered into your single source repository, or in fact, if you use programs like Adobe Acrobat Pro, you can simply drag and drop all of the files you have and then batch convert them. I will say that sometimes some of the files cause a bit of a hiccup and tend to be only sort of odd isolated files or Excel files where the page margining might be a little bit askew, but those individual files can normally be catered for on their own and don't tend to add too much to the process. Once you've then got all of your files into a PDF format, the next part is to then combine those into your electronic bundle. And again, if you use a program like Adobe Acrobat, that can be as simple as dragging and dropping those files in. In fact, if you have Adobe Pro, you could combine those last two phases, the batch conversion and combining them into a one PDF. 
An alternative option is to do something I call nested compilation, and that's actually to combine the individual documents into sections. So, for example, you may well have a pleading section, you may well have a witness statement section, you might have a document section, an authority section, whatever it may be, which we would normally replicate in a physical bundle behind various tabs. If you compile the bundle by taking the individual files that would go behind a tab and then creating a PDF for that tab, and then your second, third, fourth, etc. You then have those separate PDFs collated and you can then combine that into one PDF file. Although that creates a, an additional iterative step in the process, it saves time in the formatting, particularly as regards uh, creating an electronic index. Once we then have our PDF file, the next step is to make sure it's a fully electronic file. And there are broadly two parts to that. The first is in terms of the numbering, and by that I don't just mean adding a physical page number in the bottom right hand corner of the bundle, but I mean uh, providing an electronic numbering to those documents. I'll demonstrate that in practice because it's easy to explain there. Uh, and the second is applying OCR, optical character recognition, uh, to the bundle. In other words, making the bundle searchable and selectable. Now, if you've converted many of the documents, uh, as I've just set out in the second stage, a lot of that will have already been done. It's likely to be only the additional pages that perhaps are um, handwritten or images of scanned documents uh, which you've received in that format. Uh, but Adobe Acrobat Pro and many others are powerful enough uh, to even pick up character recognition uh, from within those documents. Now you have your completed electronic bundle. We need to cater for one final step. Uh, because, of course, we know that bundles very rarely stay static. Uh, additional documents come out of the woodwork uh, and they need to need to be added. That can be done relatively simply, but two key points to bear in mind. One, you need to deal with the repagination process. And again, by that, I mean both the physical and the electronic repagination. And lastly, you need something which I call version control. Now, that's something that's useful even in a live hearing, uh, but it's it's particularly important uh, in a remote hearing. It's often the case that we arrive at court and different copies of the bundles uh, are variant in terms of the documents that are included, uh, or indeed perhaps the index uh, doesn't match the bundle. And then it's a case of everyone scrabbling around trying to find the, the requisite pages uh, and the updated bundle and swapping them in either to the judge's version or the witness bundle, etc. Now that's okay in terms of a live hearing because you can remedy that relatively easily. But of course, if everybody is scattered through different remote locations, that becomes a logistical nightmare. The best way around that is to ensure that every time a bundle is changed, it is given a new version number and the file of the PDF uh, is match matches up with the version number that you've got. That means that everybody will know that they are on the same page. And again, I'll demonstrate that in practice. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to share my screen with you and show you the electronic bundle together. But I'm just briefly going to move on to the next part of my talk so that when I do the screen share, I can do it all in one go. Now we need to move on and consider the process of a remote hearing. James has talked about the issue of case management uh, and he's flagged up already that many protocols have already started to be developed, but they're not necessarily detailed enough. They are more generic uh, and as they apply to cases generally. What I recommend is that for each case, you have a bespoke protocol. Now that may well draw upon some of the generic protocols uh, that are out there from the courts, but they are tailored to the specifics, not only of the case, but also to the, the steps that the parties need to take. Ultimately, we are outside of our comfort zone and our daily lives have been disrupted in more ways than one. And what we're really looking at is thinking a little bit outside of the box. Now, none of this is rocket science. In fact, a lot of it is, is straightforward common sense, but not the kind of thing that is normally upon our radar. And that's really what this part of the talk is. It's about putting these things on our radar so that we can preempt problems and deal with them ahead of time. So what I'm now going to do is um, share my screen and I'm going to go through an electronic bundle and an example protocol. So here we have a bundle, in fact, one that Simon put together uh, from a moot that I've put into an electronic format. And the first, first thing to note is over here, you'll see that nested index. What I've done is I've taken the various documents, so in this case the claim form and the defence, and I turned that into a PDF which I called A Pleadings. And when I did that, it automatically created an index for me with the individual documents. And then I did the same for the statement section, so the various statements, and I compiled that 
uh, into tab C uh, and tab B simply uh, contain the application notice. I then combined tab A, B and C. And when I did so, this index uh, was created automatically for me, as was the hierarchy structure. And each of these are hyperlinks to the various documents uh, contained within the bundle and they can be clicked. They can even be edited and moved around if you so wish. But by setting out the bundle and creating it in the way that I've suggested, that exercise is done for you. It would be a considerable task without having done it in that method. The next thing I would flag up, flag up is if we look to the index, first thing you'll see there, the version number. And it's a matter for you how you decide to version your documents. The way that I do it is the first number represents the hearing. So, for example, the CCMC, an application hearing, a, a full trial hearing. And the advantage of that is you can always go back to see what the bundle looked like at any one previous hearing. And the second number reflects any amendments. So were I to add any additional documents or change this bundle, this would become version 1.2. And here you can see the index matches up with the electronic index over here on the left. But the other thing, and this is something that perhaps is not germane to anyone that's done a, an electronic bundle before, and that's the difference between what we call absolute numbering, which I'm hoping you're just out, about able to make out up here, and electronic numbering, or what we call sympathetic numbering. So just to give you an idea, this is saying page one of 23, and that's because there are physically 23 pages within this PDF. However, if I go to page 23, you'll see that actually in the bottom right hand corner, it's page 17. And the reason for that is, first of all, the index uh, is something we don't tend to paginate. And second of all, I've added documents to this bundle uh, after its initial creation, which has thrown the absolute page numbering off. And it's important, therefore, that we also have this electronic numbering because the alternative is that when you're asking the witness to go to a particular page, they're simply going to have to click through until they get to the relevant section. And sympathetic page numbering it is very easy to do. So, for example, if I were to grab hold of this um, index, I simply go to page labels and I change the page labeling. I can decide what number it starts on. I can decide its style, whether it's numerals, Roman numerals, uh, alphabetical characters, lowercase or uppercase. Um, I can also decide the prefix, which is useful if, as I've done here, where we have page six of the bundle, I've then added in um, five extra pages. Uh, and what I've done, because I want page seven here in the bottom corner to still be page seven when I type it in, I've changed the page labeling of those additional pages. And I've inserted the number six as a prefix. So when I then select the, select the style 6A, those pages become 6A, 6B, 6C. The advantage of that electronic numbering is I can say to the judge, please go to page eight. They can type into page eight and they will simply get there straight away. If you don't electronically number the documents, were you to type in page eight, you would get to a completely, sorry, uh, page eight, you would get to a completely different location. In the midst of a trial, when you want the advocates, the judge and a witness to all get to that document as quickly as possible, it's essential that those electronic page numbers and physical page numbers match up. Now over to an example of a protocol that is case specific. Ultimately, this can include whatever you feel that it ought to. I simply suggest three things, arranging the hearing, steps to be taken before the hearing and then conduct of the hearing. And uh, this will be available online, so I'm not going to go through every aspect of it. Uh, I'm going to flag up just a few points that perhaps are not necessarily obvious. So things like identifying the platform is straightforward, but how do people access it? Do they have to download software or, or like Microsoft Teams, uh, can they access it with a compatible browser? Uh, you also might want to deal with um, a, a more detailed timetabling of the trial and what steps are going to go into that timetabling uh, and set out whether or not uh, the judge intends to guillotine people if they don't stick to that timetabling. In a live hearing, it's not so much of a problem. Witnesses can either be uh, outside or even at the back of court. Of course, if you're dialing them into a remote hearing, a uh, timetabling that goes awry can be a bit more problematic. But the real issue here is in the stages before the hearing, because if everything is left until the day of the hearing itself, things will inevitably go wrong. 
Uh, and so you're going to want to set out some of those stages. And the most obvious is identifying what equipment is needed. Uh, of course, you're going to want to identify if someone uh, is going to be able to access from a computer. You might want to consider if they can access uh, from a smart device. We put this protocol together with the assistance of one of our colleagues in the PI team, uh, James Bentley. And one of the issues that arose in his case was the judge was uh, reluctant to allow participants to access via a smart device. And you can understand the logic of that. If someone's accessing on their mobile phone, there's always the risk that they're receiving text communications to assist them in their evidence. Of course, the flip side is if they're using a mobile phone, uh, they can scan the camera around the room uh, to demonstrate that they don't have anyone there with them. Uh, ultimately, it's about picking and choosing the way you want to go, but making sure the rules of engagement are set uh, as early on. You'll also want to identify what bandwidth all participants are going to be expected to have. Now, that may not sound like an obvious issue, uh, and you simply just leave it to the person to access if they are able to do so. But that creates a real problem. We know, for example, that witnesses will often use devices when caught out in cross-examination. Bundle falls apart, they drop it on the floor, uh, they just can't find the right page. Judges are equipped to assess that when a witness is in front of them and identify if it's a genuine issue or if the witness is being evasive. But if a witness starts saying, oh, I'm sorry you broke up there, I didn't hear the question, how is the judge to know if they've actually had a problem with their bandwidth or not? One of the ways to ameliorate that is to ensure that every participant tests their bandwidth. There are plenty of online uh, tools that will enable you to do that. Uh, and that you set a minimum bandwidth for their participation. I, I recommend ideally you want 20 megabits per second. It may be that you have to settle for less if you've got witnesses dialing in from a remote location. Once you start dipping below five, four megabits per second, you're really into the realms of problems and you might want to rethink if that witness can realistically take part. Another step that I think is useful is to make sure that everybody has gone through that various process, for example, testing the requirements for their equipment, providing an email, downloading the app, testing that the app works or that they have a compatible browser and confirming that they've done so uh, to the legal representative responsible for that participant, say three days before the trial, uh, and then requiring each of the parties to go through a dry run. There will still be issues on the day, but if the parties have taken that step, they can viably say to a judge, look, we've done everything we could to make sure that we'd iron out any kinks in the system. We've tested it, it worked fine. If it's not working on the day, uh, we've done all that we can. Not only will that perhaps reduce the heat if things go wrong, uh, but you also may be able to persuade the judge to keep the trial on track, because the last thing anybody wants is for a virtual hearing or a remote hearing to start and then fall apart with all the concomitant costs that that will bring. You'll want a section for dealing with the bundles. To some extent, most of that is obvious. I'm just going to flag up this one issue, and that's how many PDF files that you're going to allow. My recommendation is to try and steer the court towards one PDF file, even if it might mean combining things like uh, the evidence bundle and an authorities bundle. The advantage of that is that all the participants simply have to open one PDF. If it's been uh, properly put together as an electronic bundle, it will have an electronic index, so anyone can get to the various sections very quickly. Some judges, however, are suggesting they want that bundle broken down. They want one PDF for each section. Obviously, you'll have to comply with their preference, but, but I would try and steer them away from that. And um, you'll need a section that deals with filing. Uh, you'll need a section that deals with various other aspects uh, in terms of preparation. And then you'll need to deal with the crux of all of this, the section that deals with the conduct of the hearing. I'm not going to go into that in any great detail, but the key is here to ensure that once the hearing gets off the ground, everybody knows the rules of engagement and that hearing stays on track. Chief amongst those is how you're going to deal with crosstalk. Crosstalk happens in live hearings, but of course that can be controlled by a judge. But with a little bit of lag, that can become a problem. And so you might want to mandate that no participant is able to speak unless spoken to, and that includes if an advocate wants to raise an objection. Or you might want to allow some limited um, interjection and identify who can do so, for example, the advocates only, uh, or allow some interjection uh, by way of the chat function. And you might want to use a code word uh, to, allow, to alert the judge to the fact that someone wants to speak. You'll then need to have a section that deals with the running of the hearing. That would, to some extent, depend upon the platform you use. And then lastly, you're going to want to address witness evidence. There is obviously going to be a concern that witnesses are going to get outside assistance. They're going to have notes, 
They're going to be receiving text communication. They're going to have someone in the room with them. You can deal with that in this way. Once they've given their evidence, the protocol will set out that the judge will ask them to confirm various different things, such as the points I've just raised. And then at the end of doing so, remind the witness that given that they're on oath, anything that they've said that is untrue could expose them to a charge of perjury. And indeed, if they are suspected of contravening the rules of the hearing, that they may well open themselves up to a contempt of court charge. And that if the judge believes that to be the case, they will refer them to the CPS. Of course, you may still have some witnesses be tempted to, uh, to flout that. I, I suspect not in the vast majority of cases, but you've at least done all you can to ameliorate that risk. Hopefully that's given you a good overview of remote hearings and electronic bundles. By necessity, it can't be a complete tutorial. By all means, ask us questions. We're happy to provide some in-house training. Ultimately, we're going to suffer some war wounds as a result of these hearings. And it's about sharing those battle scars with each other so that we can learn and develop these protocols going forward. And on that note, I'm going to hand you over uh, to Simon, who's going to take you through the practical realities of a remote hearing. Thank you, Alan. And before I turn to look at the practical realities, I'll just reiterate the point that we do have the live chat function open. If anyone does want to ask us any questions as they go along, do feel free to type the question in the chat box and one of us will try and uh, answer it or otherwise we'll deal with it all at the end. And if people are just storing out questions at the very end, then um, we can deal with those then. Uh, at the start of his talk, James made the point that, strictly speaking, the ability of the court to deal with cases remotely is nothing new. But the reality is, particularly for the types of work that we do in commercial and insolvency, this is to a large extent uncharted territory. Everyone who's listened to James and Alan's uh, helpful talks should now know how to successfully participate in a remote hearing uh, and indeed how to uh, promote one and, um, and raise it for other parties. But the reality is that you'll find a lot of your opponents are not in the same position. Now, it may be that it's because they're litigants in person who either lack the technological wherewithal and know-how to participate in a remote hearing, or quite possibly, um, some might say cynically, uh, use the opportunity of the coronavirus pandemic as an excuse to avoid outcomes they wouldn't otherwise want by suggesting they can't participate meaningfully and having matters pushed off into the long grass. But it's also true that you may encounter professional opponents who haven't yet got to grips with the technology, possibly aren't even aware of the possibilities of modern technology. Uh, and just to give you a practical example from my own practice, I yesterday had a, a conference using Zoom with uh, some lay clients and a solicitor. And the solicitor two weeks ago set up the meeting by engaging an independent IT specialist who sent a three page email to all of the parties using a, a font designed to look like a typewriter, which show the level of technical proficiency he had, essentially pointing out that he'd been doing some research as to what methods there were to do remote hearings or remote conferences. He'd come across a thing called Skype that he hadn't seen before. Uh, and there was a link to a video on YouTube showing how you could use a program like that. Now, I use that slightly um, flippant example just to demonstrate the point, which is the reality is there will be a number of solicitors who are not yet up to speed with modern ways of working. Uh, and it reinforces the need for people dealing with them to be proactive and, and take charge to ensure that matters don't end up getting pushed off or lost because of the lack of ability of, of the parties to engage. And it's not just the parties, because of course the court itself uh, is not entirely au fait with, with the modern way of working. What we're seeing on the ground is that there's a real inconsistency in approach between different courts. Uh, and it's a bit like the coronavirus itself in that London appears to be very largely ahead of the curve, as you might expect. So the Rolls building has had a contingency plan in place since the end of March. Uh, for insolvency and companies court matters, you will have hopefully seen that a new temporary practice direction to supplement the insolvency practice direction uh, was signed off uh, on Monday of this week. What that does is to adjourn off all matters in insolvency and companies cases in the business and property courts, both in London and the regions that are listed for hearing before the 21st of April, other than winding up and bankruptcy petitions in London. So I'll deal with those quickly first. What's happening with winders and bankruptcy petitions is they're now being block listed in batches, which are then given their own bespoke Skype business dial in to try and make it more manageable. So the parties for each batch, which will be in sort of 15, 20 minute blocks, will be given the details. They'll all dial in to participate and then it will run 
much like the winders list runs in London at the moment with everyone pitching in and jumping in when their case is called on. The position in London in respect of everything else is that if matters are genuinely urgent, then there's a mechanism, as one might expect, for those to be brought back on sooner. Uh, and that is done by sending an email to the relevant uh, email address, setting out details of the case, explaining why it's urgent, why it needs to be heard uh, immediately. Uh, and the liaison can then take place between councils, clerk and solicitors and the court staff to ensure that happens. Uh, everything else in London is to be relisted in accordance with a protocol that is to be announced. Uh, on Tuesday, the senior insolvency uh, and companies court judge, or, or Nick as he's known in chambers, um, helpfully published a further guidance on the sorts of work that's going to be treated automatically as urgent. Uh, and that includes things like applications um, uh, um, under Section 17 of the Companies Directors Disqualification Act for Leave to Act, applications under Section 216 of the Insolvency Act for uh, permission to reuse prohibited names, public interest winding up petitions, applications concerning schemes of arrangement, capital reductions, cross border mergers and the like. Uh, and that's all in keeping really with the situation in London, which is they seem to have embraced the modern technology, hearings can take place remotely, they're all set up for that but they're experiencing a glut of urgent work coming in dealing with matters that really touch upon the solvency immediately of individuals and companies and so they've cleared the decks removed some of the ordinary work out for a temporary period to be able to service that but going forward we're seeing them easily using methods of modern uh, remote working such as skype for business and james mentioned at the start of his talk of course the one blackfriars case from earlier this week where it was made clear that a five-week trial would have to go ahead by those means. Outside of London in the business and property courts, well, the centres are not massively far behind London. James has already mentioned Birmingham and Bristol and the protocols that they've put out. Uh, the Vice Chancellor of the Palatine, Mr Justice Snowden, issued a guidance note uh, on the same day as uh, the guidance came out with the temporary insolvency practice direction for work in the BPCs in the North and North East. Uh, and essentially they have adopted the procedure in relation to winding up petitions and bankruptcy petitions in London. So that is to be done also in batches by remote working. Uh, and that also sets out some guidance on the sorts of applications that are to be treated as urgent, uh, which is similar to those that I've just outlined. They additionally uh, include applications for validation orders. Uh, and then they make the point that actually the demand and volume of work in the North is not as great as it would be in London at the moment. And so they're making real efforts to ensure that everything can continue to be heard by converting it to remote means. Outside of the business and property courts in the county courts, well, it's fair to say that a lot of the regional courts have been slower to adapt. Uh, and we have seen various matters which could easily have been dealt with by way of remote hearings being adjourned off, predominantly because of lack of um, awareness amongst the courts as to how things can be set up remotely. Um, and, and just generally, as you imagine, the, the volume of work coming in from matters that are not just commercial insolvency type matters, but also the run of the mill stuff that would usually be knock about work in the county court. So what I would echo and stress the point that's been made by James and by Alan repeatedly is that it is important to be proactive. It's important to do anything and everything that you can to assist the court and particularly the judges, many of whom are going to be working from home, may not have the necessary technology installed on their own laptops, may not have um, the ability to set up anything their end, uh, to try and keep the show on the road and make sure that things can, can continue to be heard that also means, I think, a higher degree of cooperation with the other side to a case than you might otherwise do. Obviously, we're used to having a very adversarial system um, in England and Wales, where often anything that can be done to help an opponent may be seen as in some way injuring or prejudicing the interests of, of the lay client. Well, pretty much the opposite is the status quo at the moment. So when you're conducting a remote hearing, be it by telephone or video link, make sure that you have got contact details for the people who are going to be attending from the other side, not just an email address, but a mobile phone number as well, some means of readily getting hold of them so that if there's any teething issues, if anything happens shortly before a hearing, that means it might have to go off or could potentially be uh, prejudiced, then have you got a means of contacting everyone to try and resolve that quickly? Litigants in person I mentioned at the start, and as I made the point, there is a real risk that some of them might use this as an opportunity strategically to try and avoid a hearing by suggesting that they don't have the ability to participate. And of course, the court's going to be aware of the overriding objective. If there's any suggestion that the litigant in person isn't able to participate meaningfully in the hearing, it's not going to go ahead. So what steps could you take to try and ensure that that isn't a problem? 
one possibility, obviously subject to the, the appropriate social distancing guidelines in accordance with the government advice, is making maybe a room available in an office with the relevant uh, video conferencing facilities, a microphone, computer and the like to enable a litigant in person to, uh, to take part. Although obviously note the point that James made at the start, which is query whether traveling um, for the purposes of court hearing would be urgent term travel. But certainly given that advocates are being treated as key workers in the current climate when they have a court hearing, there may be a powerful argument to be made for suggesting that steps should be taken by litigants in person to ensure hearings can go ahead. Uh, I'm mindful of the, the fact that we've now reached four o'clock, but I just had a few other quick brief observations if you indulge me. Firstly, we've been talking quite a lot about video conferences for obvious reason, not least because it's the means by which we're conducting this session and it obviously has a lot of advantages. My experience is that several courts are defaulting in the first instance to telephone hearings because they're more used to telephone hearings. Obviously, they've been around for a long time uh, and they ought to be on their face easier to conduct fewer infrastructure problems. Well, they should be straightforward, but then aren't always. And just to give you again another practical example for my own practice, which serves as a note of caution. Last week, I had a telephone hearing in the Business and Property Courts in Cardiff on a director's disqualification matter. It had been set down for a directions hearing. The parties had agreed fairly sensible directions and sent in a consent order, but the court insisted the matter would need to go ahead. The court arranged a telephone hearing by BT Meet Me. The notice of hearing came out, which provided an 0800 number for the parties to call and a passcode um, for us to dial in order to get into the hearing. The number which was provided by the court when I rang it was actually a switchboard that gave a menu of five options. Press one to speak to an operator, press two to pay your bill, etc. None of the options involved speaking to the judge. I had to go through two different operators who eventually were able to explain to me that the number I'd been given was wrong and was the general switchboard for BT Meet Me. What I should have been given was the relevant local dial out number for uh, the court services when eventually I was able using the communication method I set aside with the other side's uh, representative to get into the court hearing and having spent about 20 minutes listening to some fairly god awful Muzak uh, we were told by the court staff who had insisted by the way that the number they'd given us was correct and didn't know what BT were talking about uh, that the judge had eventually given up trying and simply granted the order we were seeking on paper uh, and, and sorry for our, our troubles. Now, obviously, the outcome for that wasn't particularly disastrous, but it could well have been. Um, and the motto I think I take from that is just because the court has set something up, don't assume that they've done it properly. Uh, and rather than leaving it to the last minute, it's always best if you get a notice coming out of the court suggesting they've arranged a telephone hearing to try and take steps to check and make sure it is properly set up. It is ready to go ahead and, and you've got all the right dying details and so does the judge. I appreciate that to an extent there's only so far you can go in, in trying to get guidance out of the court, particularly we know there's some county courts are worse than others but anything and everything you can do and it just feeds back into this theme of being proactive helping out the court um, should be done now in terms of video hearings themselves alan's already highlighted a lot of the key points which are addressed in his um, in the protocol including arrangements around ensuring there's no crosstalk thinking about who should be speaking a couple of other just practical tips firstly obviously normally when a hearing is going ahead uh, in court there will be a means for an in instructing solicitor to contact counsel to, to discuss matters or raise things that should be raised to them in a confidential way, be it scribbling on a post-it note, having a quick word outside court during a recess um, or, or the like. Uh, that's not going to be something that can be readily done via whatever medium you're using for video hearings. So make sure that you have set aside um, a back channel so that um, you are able to have those conversations as you go along. There's no real rhyme or reason to what method you might choose to use. WhatsApp Messenger works fairly well, obviously. Emails work OK. We're using Teams at the moment to conduct this call. There is, as you have seen, the chat function that lets you uh, type uh, amongst the people on a call. There is a possibility to have a separate private chat going, but obviously just be a little bit careful before you start typing, this judge is an idiot or the witness is, doesn't know what they're saying or anything that might be privileged, that you've actually typed it in the right box and haven't inadvertently revealed it to um, the entirety of the court. Another practical tip in terms of video hearings, this only really applies to Microsoft Teams because its function isn't available on Zoom um, or I believe Skype, although Adam will correct me if I'm wrong on that point. Uh, but you'll have noticed throughout the course of um, my presentation, one of the things I've forgotten to do, in fact, is to blur my background. 
So many of you may have been more distracted staring at uh, the books on the shelf behind me and trying to work out why there's a giant teddy bear uh, at the top of the screen rather than actually listening to what I'm saying. Uh, and obviously, if you're attempting to conduct a hearing in front of a judge, it's quite a good idea to have their attention focused on the advocates and uh, not on anything extraneous. So if you remember to blur the background, which can be readily done through Teams, then it just avoids any unnecessary um, distractions. Two final points um, from me. The first one um, is on time estimates. Uh, and I appreciate there may be a degree of irony me making this point now five minutes after our initially allotted time estimate for this presentation. Uh, but it rather neatly illustrates this point, which is a lot of the hearings you'll be doing remotely over the course of the next few weeks will be matters which were originally listed for an in-person hearing, have had to be converted to a remote hearing because of the coronavirus epidemic, uh, and will have been listed with a time estimate that the parties agreed, uh, or which the court imposed, by reference to how long you thought the hearing would last when it was going to take place in person. Almost certainly, a remote hearing is going to take longer, at least in the early stages while we're getting to grips with how they work. Uh, because whereas issues that could be qu quite easily ironed out when everyone's in the same room, such as a judge might be on the wrong page or uh, there might be something missing from the bundle that needs to be handed up, uh, or, or there may be um, a, a particular authority that, that the judge wants the parties to, to find for them or, or whatever the issue may be, that's going to take longer on a, on a remote hearing. There also may be issues concerning um, witnesses who have to come in and give evidence if they're ready to give evidence at the right time or not. Uh, and so be wary of before a hearing launches, actually do you need to ask the court for a little bit more time than, than initially because a judge won't thank you if the matter overruns uh, and you haven't given sufficient advance warning. Alan also um, suggested that there's a real prospect that the court might start imposing fairly stringent guillotines to ensure they can get through remote hearings. Uh, and on the one hand, that may cause some frustration. On the other, though, it's always best practice to try and ensure that any arguments you put are as succinct and concise as possible and that you avoid as much as possible any extraneous verbiage. Uh, and so it's not a bad way and not a bad habit for any, any hearing generally, and it focuses the mind to just try and think of what are the essential points that the judge needs to know? What can I usefully avoid having to deal with? And that feeds full circle back into the point James was making at the start about electronic bundles again. We're going to have to get used to a new way of working. There's a habit that's formed in the past of chucking everything into a very large lever arch files of bundles, and you may end up having a separate bundle that contains all the stuff that you don't think the judge will need to see, but it's there just in case. Uh, it's going to be the same with dealing with remote hearings, the same with um, dealing with submissions. Uh, and the final thought from me in terms of practical points before we turn to look at any questions that you may have is, is actually a more optimistic one, which is this. Re as I said at the outset, the possibility of doing hearings remotely is not a new concept and I suspect quite a lot of people on this call are probably already using the technology effectively to deal with conferences and the like. And there are an awful lot of hearings that we have to do, which we have to do in person, that really don't need to be in person. And I'm thinking in particular of case management conferences and PTRs in cases where most of the issues have been agreed between the parties. They're relatively uncontroversial uh, and it doesn't really require counsel traipsing up to say Manchester from Bristol, a seven hour round trip, spending a night potentially in a hotel, uh, not being able to have an instructing solicitor with them because it's deemed to be disproportionate to incur the expenses of two people pitching up all that way, uh, given that there's not a lot to argue about, but there might still be a few important issues to deal with. Um, they take up time, they take up resources, they take up the court's time, uh, and there is no reason at all why they can't be conducted by remote means. Now, the, the message we're getting very much from the judiciary is that they would like to progress uh, the possibility of having uh, you know remote means used effectively for various types of hearings uh, but the, um, the potential downside of that is that they haven't had the exposure to using it or the ability to understand if it works or not and in a brutal way we're now going to have to embrace that uh, and if we can and again it's all part of this message of being proactive helping out the court if we can show that the remote hearings can work effectively and in many respects can actually be better than in-person hearings, then the judiciary will follow on quite quickly, I've no doubt. Uh, and we can then really look to move into the 21st century in terms of some of our working methods, whilst appreciating and accepting that um, traditional working methods in terms of in-person hearings will still be needed, obviously, for things like trials, summary judgment applications that are more heavyweight, more contested hearings and the like. That was everything which I proposed to say in terms of practical realities. Uh, I can see that whilst I've been speaking, the chat function has been slowly filling up with people's questions. Um, so perhaps Alan and uh, James can help me to, to sift through those and uh, raise whatever has been, been raised by way of questions.
Uh, um, yes, yeah, Simon, there was a question, I think James has answered it in part, but it was how far in advance would we, uh, should we be arranging BT telecoms? Uh, James has obviously responded by saying at the moment we, it's the other way around, actually we're expecting the courts to be the ones arranging them, but I don't know if you had any other thoughts on that. My, so my experience is that um, obviously at the moment the court itself is trying to sift its way through a backlog of matters and it's getting inundated with people trying to uh, rearrange hearings. The reality is that the, the lockdown is not going to be lifted anytime soon. If we want hearings to go ahead, then they're going to need to be done remotely. If you've identified things that you think are apt or suitable to be dealt with by remote means, I'd be urging you to try and take steps to arrange them now. Um, and if in due course we find that we come out of this pandemic quicker than we expect and it's decided that we could revert to an in-person hearing, well then arrangements can be put in train at a later stage. There does seem to be an inconsistency as to how telephone hearings are being arranged. I know anecdotally that in a lot of courts it's being arranged by the court on the basis that they don't want to have to give out the judges personal telephone numbers to the parties and so therefore what is being done is that the courts arrange it, the judge dials out to the parties um, but there is the possibility to arrange a telephone conference in such a way as the judge is given a number to dial in to and BT Meet Me certainly has that function uh, and I agree that whilst, as I think James said in the comments, at the moment the courts are largely taking the initiative on this, not all of them are uh, and if you're able to, to go to the court in line with the business property court protocol saying look the parties have had a discussion, we've identified this particular hearing is suitable for remote hearing, we think the apt way of doing it is telephone video con depending on which one it might be. Uh, we have made inquiries and we can do it using this method and this is how we propose to arrange it. Then it's going to be a lot easier for the court staff to say thank you, We the judge accepts that approach rather than just simply ringing up a court and saying I've got a hearing on the 3rd of May, is it going to be dipped by telephone or is it going ahead or what? Just picking up on Simon's point there, I had a telephone hearing by way of B BT Meet Me this morning um, it was remarkable, partly because it's, it, it was arranged in a completely different way to the, the way Simon's hearing was arranged, rather than the parties being asked to dial in, the court dialed out to us. But we then had about a quarter of an hour trying to get connected because the judge's clerk had no idea how to connect people. So we had about three separate cycles of the judge trying to dial out to the judge and just hanging up on the advocates. Um, as we said in one of the comments, I think we're going to need to, to some extent, allow a bit of a grace period. They're trying to find their feet. But the key here really is about us being proactive and coming back to the protocol. And there was a similar question about how far in advance uh, our courts sending out their missives as to what they're going to do. I, I think really what we want to try and do is assist the courts as much as possible. And so I'd recommend actually getting your case specific protocols together, agreeing it with the other side and actually proactively contacting the court. Some people are going to be able to effectively participate in remote hearing. Some cases can't be done that way. If, you're pro if you are proactive, you are far more likely to persuade the court that you are one of the ones that can go ahead. We also need to bear in mind that once this is all lifted, once the lockdown ends, there is going to be an enormous backlog of work that they're going to have to click through. And you don't want to be at the back end of that. If you've managed to be proactive and get your case out of the way, you've essentially jumped the queue a little bit. Just a final allied point on that, uh, James, I think I'm right in saying that in the one Blackfriars matter, you had one side who were setting out to the court, this is how we can do it remotely. You had the other side saying, this is impossible to do remotely. And unsurprisingly, the judge found favour with a party who was saying it could be done, or at least suggested that they should explore further whether that was a possibility. So I think the reality is that if one side is banging a drum and saying they think that something can go ahead remotely, um, I think the other side is going to have a real uphill struggle to find a compelling or convincing reason why it's not apt to do so. And I appreciate that everyone on this call may have certain hearings in mind, which would be quite nice to be able to get shot of um, and come up with some creative way to suggest it simply must be dealt with in person. But if a five day trial involving the handling of quite a lot of witnesses in a £250 million matter can go ahead by remote means, there's going to be few and far between those cases of much smaller value and less complexity that aren't capable of being dealt with remotely. I would have thought so. When we had um, his Honour Judge Cotter on, on Monday, um, the session we ran, I think the message we were getting from him is 
even though the county court is behind. The county court is not behind because they're reluctant to hold remote hearings. It is very much a capacity issue. Um, as we see on the phone issue, they lack capacity for people to answer the phones. Their IT isn't up and running. But if parties come to them with technological solutions, they are willing to consider them. So, um, as Simon says, if you are proactive, if you are suggesting solutions, then judges are likely to go for that and are likely to go for that over and above. Someone say, actually, this can't be done. It's far too difficult. Please do feel free to keep firing your questions at us. Um, you can either do it in the chat window or if you prefer, you're more than welcome to open up your microphones and cameras and, and chat to us. Um, I did post um, the email addresses for me, James and Simon further up. I'm just going to post them again now so that at the bottom of the feed, there they are. So again, you can either continue to fire questions at us through the chat window, or if afterwards you think of anything, do drop us an email. Okay, it looks like people are starting to make their way, so um, we'll, we'll stick around and answer questions, but in the meantime, um, have a great bank holiday weekend if anyone's keeping track of time. <laughs>